Right. Well, thanks a lot. Anyway. And, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, so I'm Bettina Eich, that's true. And um, perhaps I say a few words to begin with to put you into the picture how I fit into all of this here. So long time ago, I started my research life as a PhD student in Aachen. That was the place where GAP was written at that time. And I was a member of the group who did all the writing, just as Alexander Hulke as well. So we were colleagues and shared an office at that time. So um, I took part in the setting up of GAP in, I think that was from 1990 to 1995, six or seven. Um, I was part of the GAP group at that time. And uh, yeah, since then it has been remained a significant part of my research life to develop items for all kinds of groups, applications for that. So it's still quite a significant part of my research. And uh, well, when Philippe wrote to us that we should uh, take part in this summer school, Alexander and I, and also Graham Ellis, we discussed how we would split up the world to tell you all about it. And um, it became my part to talk about this particular type of groups, polycyclic groups. Uh, well, why would one single out polycyclic groups? So as Alexander told you, um, algorithmic group theory but depends a lot on the type of group you're using. You have different algorithms for different types of groups. The longest known type is the permutation group world, where you just use the action on the underlying set to understand the group, right? So that's permutation groups. Then there are matrix groups. It's quite similar to permutation groups. You use the action on your underlying vector space to understand what the group is. The investigation is a little bit different and it's more involved with matrix groups, but the big ideas are very <coughs> similar to the permutation group <coughs> world. And then on the other end, there are finitely presented groups. Those came from topology in the beginning. People from topology had these groups occurring naturally and wanted to know things about it. And yeah, computational group theory was asked, hey, what can you do with it? And here the algorithms are completely different. And many things are not very easy. So there are many questions that you can't do for finitely presented groups. So that's the type of group which is very dif difficult to handle. And in between of that, there are the so-called polycyclic groups. Um, they come with a very nice structure. And that's the reason why people uh, look at it. So this nice structure can be used to develop algorithms for this type of group and applications of that. And that makes them very unique and very interesting in the computational world. So very often is this the case that if you have a group and you want to know something about it, then well, one of the first things that you can do is check whether it is polycyclic, and if so, then you, it's a good idea to use the structure to investigate the group. Many things are much faster and much easier if you do that. Right, so this is a sort of big picture how this all fits together. So polycyclic groups is a huge collection of algorithms which are sitting beside the permutation group, matrix group, and finitely presented world. And uh, well, yeah, if you happen to look at polycyclic groups, then it's very useful to use this here. Perhaps I should also say a few how it fits into this workshop. So the workshop is homology, geometry, number theory. Yeah, so from the polycyclic groups world, well, geometry is a wide topic. You can do all kinds of things under the label of geometry. There are certainly applications to certain types of geometry from the polycyclic groups world. I'll tell you a little bit about that in my last talk on Biberbach groups is going to be on Friday. Cohomology, well, cohomology gets used in algorithms for polycyclic groups. And it's my topic for the talks tomorrow that I tell you a little bit about how can you compute cohomology 
using polycyclic structures. And number theory plays also a big role in all of these algorithms for polycyclic groups. So Bill knows me from asking lots of um, questions. How do I do this? How do I do that? Because I would like to use um, Pari and number theory questions in my methods for polycyclic groups. So, yeah, in the end, this is also the plan that I have for the next few lectures. So this year is um, the first two lectures. I'm going to just describe the basic setup and how to compute with polycyclic groups. This is lecture one and two. Is sort of basics for polycyclic groups. And then tomorrow, the two lectures, that's three and four, I'm going to say a little bit about cohomology. And in particular, for polycyclic groups acting. And then on the last talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about of all of this applications. And this is about almost Bieberbach groups. Bieberbach groups. And it's an old joint work of myself together with Karel de Kimpe. Right, so that's the plan of my lectures and also how it fits to the workshop here. All right, so let's start with, first of all, understand what is a polycyclic group. I've written up the definition up there. A group is called polycyclic if it has a series, and the series should be subnormal <laughs> so that the quotients are cyclic. Perhaps I write this up on the blackboard because it will be useful to remember even with the slide is gone. So a group is polycyclic. This means there exists a series G1 and normal and that is G2 and so on down to Gn and Gn plus 1 is trivial with all the quotients Gi over Gi plus 1 being cyclic. It can be finite cyclic or infinite cyclic. So these groups can be finite or infinite. And uh, yeah, this actually makes a big difference whether you have to deal with finite or infinite groups. So there are a few examples on the slide here. Trivial examples, well, the finitely generated abelian groups are all polycyclic because a finitely generated abelian group, there is this main theorem telling you that these are direct products of cyclic groups and you can sort of take this direct product apart to get a sequence of subgroups like I want to have there. Then finitely generated nilpotent groups are also all polycyclic. It's not quite so simple as for the um, abelian groups but almost a finitely generated nilpotent group has a central series. The quotients are all finitely generated abelian. And now you can then just take the series and stick, um, stick polycyclic sequences for each of the quotients together to get a series like uh, it's desired. So those all are polycyclic. It means also that, for example, every group of prime power order is polycyclic because that's nilpotent. So it's a huge class of groups. Then there are two um, yeah, examples like this symmetric group S3 and S4 are polycyclic. It's well known. S5 and so on is not polycyclic anymore. It's a famous Galois theory. But those small ones are. And there are many, many more permutation groups that are polycyclic. For example, this one here printed it on the screen, and I assure it is polycyclic. And I must 
question why. Yeah, I don't think one wants to compute this necessarily by hand. It's a permutation group on 15 points. And uh, proving that it's polycyclic means that you have to write down a series like over there. Um, it's not quite so easy to do this by hand. But if you ask GAP about it, type these two permutations into GAP and ask whether it's polycyclic, it will tell you instantly. Yes, of course, that is polycyclic. I hope, if I have not have a typo in there, then, <laughs> then it's a disaster. Is it an infinite group? No, no, it's a permutation group on 15 points. 15. 16, perhaps, but never mind. I mean, so its order divides 16 factorial, okay. and uh, it's going to be fine. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't even record what the, or, what the order is. I think I've picked it up from the transitive groups library and just printed it on the screen here. And if you happen to have gaps, you can tell me what the order is. Type it in there. And uh, the last, the fifth example uh, is a group with two generators, and the two generators are matrices over the integers. Uh, I um, again stated that this is polycyclic and asked the question why. In this case, it's not so difficult to observe that it's polycyclic. Um, you can quite easily work out that this generator B um, generates a normal subgroup in the whole group, and B is quite obviously isomorphic to the infinite cyclic groups, to the additive group of the integers. Because if you power this generator up, so B squared is going to be the matrix that has a 1, a 2, 0, 1, and so on. So if you take a power of B, the power is just going to show up in this upper right corner there. So this is generating an infinite cyclic group isomorphic to the integers and it's normal, and if you quotient it out, what you get is just generated by A, and this is a cyclic group of order two. So the sequence, the sequence you get infinite cyclic group, and on top of that, a cyclic group of order two, and that is polycyclic. Okay, yes? What about if you take the, the two columns in A, and you get the modular group, is that also polycyclic? I change the two columns. So then you get the, the S. SL2 Z. No, no, that's not polycyclic, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's a finite index of the integer. Which one? This, this in SL? No. No. In SL, not, not, no, no. I don't think so. No, so So SL2Z is isomorphic. It has a free subgroup of finite index. And that's very far away from being polycyclic. No, that can't be mm -hmm. a polycyclic subgroup of finite index. No, no. No way. <laughs> right. So yeah, anyway, this one here is polycyclic, having this normal subgroup on that on top. But uh, it's a special case. Very often, you can't see it quite so easily, whether a matrix is polycyclic or not. All right, so let's see. That's as much as polycyclic goes, yeah. And there are many questions now on how do, you comp how do I compute with these groups? Um, what is known about the structure? Perhaps a few bits and pieces are useful for you to learn about it. And in particular, how polycyclic groups compare to the infinite world? Yeah, imp an important theorem is number two. It's all well known. You um, can find it in every group theory book. A, a group is polycyclic if it's solvable, and every subgroup is finitely generated. That's right, and that tells you, well, solvable groups are very nice in their own right. And these ones here, the polycyclic groups, for those, there are all, all subgroups finitely generated. And that is one of the reasons why they are so nice for computations. In effect, you can write down every subgroup. That's a nice feature, because they're all finitely generated. OK. So, so yes? Oh. Every, every, no, every subgroup. So, J itself? 
is also finitely generated, yes? We we'll come to that very soon. So it means that the finite polycyclic groups are exactly the finite solvable groups. So for finite groups, it doesn't make a difference whether you say polycyclic or solvable. And there are very many of them. You can look it up, for example, if you know the small groups library, library of groups of small order. Have you seen that? Have you? No? You might want to check it out. It's in GAP. You can access this from GAP. And uh, it's called Small Groups Library. And um, it's a library, for example, of all groups of order up to 2000. Groups of order at most. 2000 with one exception except 1024 and the groups are in there up to isomorphism so it counts isomorphism types of groups if you look that up then you will find the very vast majority of all groups are finite polycyclic or finite and, and solvable if you okay. So at least we don't talk about the empty set. Good thing. Right. Yeah, so now what is there to learn about the structure? What else is there to learn about the structure? I have another theorem tells you a little bit more about polycyclic groups and it says that you can sort of take the infinite bits and the finite bits in this polycyclic sequence apart. So you can arrange it so that um, if you have all the infinite bits at the bottom of your group and the finite bits of your polycyclic series on the top. So if I read this theorem, it's perhaps also a good idea. Uh, if G is polycyclic, then there exists a normal subgroup N so that N is poly Z, poly infinite cyclic, and the quotient G mod N is finite. So poly Z means you have a series of subgroups with infinite cyclic quotients only, and the um, quotient G mod N is finite, means that you have a polycyclic series. Well, and you can always refine that then so that uh, your series only has quotients of prime order. Okay, so it means that you can split this all a little bit apart if you want. Right, let me see. Question, yeah? Could you also uh, revert this? So first take the finite quotient and then take the infinite ones? Is that not, not a good idea? Well, the finite bits are on top and the infinite ones at the bottom right now, After, according to the theorem, and the reverse doesn't, doesn't, work. doesn't okay. always work. If you look at this, this infinite dihedral thing, this uh, matrix group, it wouldn't work with that, for example. So if you have this minus one, zero, zero, one, and one, 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 zero, this group here, it does not have a normal subgroup um, of finite order at all. It has a finite quotient, but not a normal subgroup of finite order. So it's not going to work. Any more questions? You can ask. Uh, Go for it. Just maybe uh, Mark, I think the group, uh, the first group with the two elements and uh, uh, generated by two elements. The two permutations, yes? Uh, when I do it in GAP, it tells me that uh, it's not polycyclic. It is not polycyclic? OK, I'll mm -hmm. check it out later. Okay, okay. I, I, it might be a typo. Yeah. <laughs> but you co you copy the you copy the permutations, right? What does it say? Did you type them or did you copy them? No, I type as I don't have access to the document. Ah, Philip, did you send it? It is online now. No, it's it's true for me. It's true. 
Very good. <laughs> Oh, maybe, maybe it depends on the uh, OS. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, theory. so you have a polycyclic group now, that's G, and um, it may be an infinite, it's an infinite polycyclic. And then uh, there is an important theorem that says that the number of infinite cyclic quotients in a polycyclic series is an invariant of the group. And it's called the Hirsch length, according to a mathematician named Hirsch, who was perhaps the first one who investigated um, the theory of polycyclic groups. So that's invariant. You can't change it. The number of finite factors is not an invariant. right? And I've put up an example up there. If you take um, the infinite cyclic group, then you can have lots of polycyclic series in that. You can just take the infinite cyclic group and the trivial subgroup. That's one polycyclic series. But you can also chop off lots of finite quotients on the top of the group, and thereby get longer and longer polycyclic series all the time. In fact, there are infinitely many polycyclic series, and the number of finite factors is completely arbitrary. It can be anything between one and whatever you wish. So the infinite factors are, in that sense, a little bit nicer than the finite factors. OK, so this is a very brief introduction into the theory of polycyclic groups. There is lots and lots known about the structure of these um, groups. It's a very nice theory sitting behind that. But I think we um, now have a look at computation <coughs> with these objects and think about how would one compute with them. For example, with the permutation group, you compute with the underlying um, set and use that to investigate the group. So you try to figure out, are there any orbits? Are there any blocks? How can you split up the group using these invariants? But here, you don't have any of that. You just have the structure of the group, and you have to use that to compute with it. So it's a slightly different way of uh, approaching the business of computation. So well. I'd say we take a polycyclic group with a given polycyclic series. And now what we do for every um, quotient of this series, it's a cyclic quotient, we choose a generator of this quotient. And that gives us a sequence of the same length as the polycyclic sequence. And it's called a PC sequence. It has, well, it has a variety of names. The naming scheme here is unfortunately not very good. Perhaps I um, put it up here as well. So we go on and continue from here. So we choose GI um, times GI plus 1, a generator of GI modulo GI plus 1. And this gives a sequence G1 up to Gn. And that's a well, PC sequence per polycyclic sequence. Sometimes it's PCP. Sometimes it's an old-fashioned program. So it may even be AG. AG stands for Auflösbare Gruppe. And in the old days, this has been used by Neuwieser, who introduced these things. So AG, PCP, PC, it's all this. Huh? PC for polycyclic. A, auflösbar, soluble in German. So really, yeah, the history of this is, is quite long, really. I think the first use of polycyclic sequences goes back to Zulo, who used it to investigate Zulo subgroups. So his very old proof that Zulo subgroups exist in every finite group uses a sort of concept like that. So Zulu was really the first who tried to use something like that. And then it got, it got introduced to the polycyclic, to the computational world by my former, by my PhD supervisor, Neubiser. And then from there, um, yeah, had ongoing. All right.
and attached to these uh, choices of generators. I also frequently need the size of this coat here. So Ri is the size of the order of this quotient. That's the sequence of relative orders then. R1 up to Rn are relative orders. Those two objects are very important. OK, now, what can we say if we have something like that? We have a polycyclic group and a PC sequence and the sequence of relative orders. No. Ah, there is a typo on the slide. I'm afraid. Anyway, so it says if all of these Ri's bigger than zero, then the group order is just the product of the Ri's. What I really mean is if all the Ri's are not infinity, then the order of the group is the product of them. So if I have an infinite relative order somewhere, then of course the group has to have infinite order. And if this does not happen, then the group order is just the product of the relative orders. That goes back, this is just Lagrange theorem um, applied. And uh, yeah, I, you will find out uh, soon why I made this typo. In gap, when I use these relative orders in gap, then an infinite relative order is represented by zero. So gap will tell you a zero there. And uh, this is the reason for this typo here. And the second very important fact is um, the PC sequences give you a normal form for your elements. So an element in the group has a unique representation as product of the PC sequence, as ordered product of the element of the uh, PC sequence, where the exponents are either integers or, if you have a finite, relative order, then there are even between 0 and um, the relative order minus 1. Right. And this is called normal form of the element. And the corresponding vector is its exponent vector. Is it really a typo? Because you said um, that b above r i equals 0 if the index is infinite. Oh, really? I did that. Well, excellent. No, then there is no typo. And I've translated it right away. Very good. Yes. So this is also the convention that GAP is using. So we will see shortly. So I've used the GAP convention right away here. OK. Yeah, so if you look at this matrix group here, as I found out already in the beginning, this here really is a PC sequence for my matrix group. These two elements, A and B, A and B, they are a PC sequence. This element here has infinite order, and this here has order 2. So this means my group now can be written as um, A to the E1 times B to the E2. And E1 goes between um, 0 and 1. E2 is an integer. Okay, so my infinite. Can you do that? No. But why can you write it? This is this is <laughs> this is really what the proof of this theorem there oh, tells you, right? Every element of group can be written as an ordered product of this form, and I know exactly in what range the exponents have to lie. And yes, it's true; it's not commutative. But if you do something like take b times a, then what happens? I know B sits in a normal subgroup, so I can move the A apart. I may get an exponent. In this case, I get minus 1. But never mind, I can move it apart. Is that correct? Yeah. The plug in the dihedral group. That's exactly. I mean, this is the dihedral group. Infinite. Yeah. Um, I think the minus 1 is rather over here. Never mind, right? It means I can move all instances of a lower down generator to the top. I may get different exponents, but that doesn't bother me. All right, so we have a normal form. That's the next 
step in it. And now there is one more ingredient before we can look at some gap stuff. And that is uh, polycyclic presentations. Now, so far, we have looked at sequences of elements. These elements could be anything. Like, they can be matrices, they can be permutations, whatever. But if you look at gap code, or gap, um, you will find that mostly this is not how it's done. Instead, it translates all of these objects to a certain type of present, a finite presentation, and then uses that to compute. Well, Alexander told you yesterday, final presentations are very difficult objects, and many things are fairly hard to figure out. But uh, that's true in general, but not for the polycyclic world. Here, you can actually use these polycyclic presentations for a lot of uh, good, uh, uh, fast and efficient computations. OK. So for the polycyclic presentations, we have to change our point of view a little bit. We start. Now, we don't start with a polycyclic group. We just start with a list of abstract generators and a bunch of elements which are either natural numbers or zero. And using that, I now set up a finite presentation. I'm afraid that's just on the skip of the page. And this finite presentation has a certain type of um, uh, relators and generators. So perhaps keep in mind what's going on here. <coughs> Could perhaps just translate this here to a presentation of that type. So that you have something to hang on to. Okay. No. I should take generators, and then the relations have to be, have two different forms. Either I power one of my generators by a natural number, or I take conjugates with um, the other generators. So in the case of this particular group here, perhaps I just do it in this example, I would get something like a squared, because this here has a finite relative order. And I have to take um, pairs of generators and consider um, conjugates. So it would be a to the minus 1 b a and a b a to the minus 1 that I have to look at. And now I want to have this as a presentation. Oh, yeah. Yes? I think you want it the other way around, because a equals a inverse. Um, well, the general is the one given over there. So I have to take gi, gj, uh, gi to the minus 1, gj, gi, and i is smaller than j. And I conjugate by the inverse as well. So I really have, first of all, to consider those two relations. In this particular case, it's the same, oh. yes. But uh, the general form is like that. Now, a squared is just the identity um, b conjugate by a gives you b to the minus 1. And b conjugate by the inverse of a also gives you b minus 1. So this is what would happen if I try to write up a presentation of this form for this group here. And uh, well, it looks all fairly technical, because the general case um, yeah. is a little bit technical. But what you do is you consider conjugates and powers of your elements, write them in the normal form that we determined on the slide before and then put all of this in a presentation. That gives you what's called a PCP presentation. Polycycle, uh, PCP can stand for different things. Power commutator presentation, power conjugate presentation. These, again, the naming scheme is not unique, but never mind. Let's call it PCP presentation. OK. Now, and in our example, the PCP presentation uh, looks like this. And we could just keep this in mind. That's a nice and easy example <coughs> for these things. Um, yeah, There are two uh, small observations. First is, each polycyclic group has a PCT, PCP presentation. Um, what I do to get it is I take the setup 
with the uh, piece sequence. So I have my polycyclic group with the sequence. I can take um, the PC generators for it and the relative orders. And then I write out powers and commutators in normal form, like on the previous slide, put this together and get a PCP presentation. So that's basically the proof for lemma six. And uh, the other lemma says, well, if I come up with a PCP presentation, then it represents a polycyclic group. Why is that? Well, again, that's not so difficult to observe because the relations tell you that it should be polycyclic. These two types of conjugate um, relations that you have ensure that you have a subnormal series induced by the generators, and uh, therefore you get a polycyclic group. The generators will be a polycyclic uh, sequence. Um, a slight problem is there with the relative orders. This is why they come in brackets afterwards. And this slight problem is a little bit more um, elaborated in the text here. So if I have these relative orders associated with the polycyclic sequence, then I call um, a PCP presentation confluent if the relative orders coincide with the exponents in the presentation. Okay. It's not guaranteed that this happens. But if it happens, then that's a good thing. In fact, many algorithms in GAP, or practically all of them, assume that the polycyclic presentations that you give them to computers are confluent. Um, it can be checked whether a presentation is confluent, and I think we will do that in GAP examples later on. Um, it's rather technical to learn how this works. I think we'll skip that for the moment. It can be checked, and it's important. And if you want to run algorithms on polycyclic presentations, you better make sure that they are confluent to begin with. If they are confluent, then um, this here also means that um, elements always have a normal form, right? Because then you really have a PC sequence of elements, and the powers S1 up to Sn are exactly a, um, the relative orders, so you can determine normal forms for your elements. All right, and now perhaps to look at a little bit of gap code. Let's see. Did I manage this just as well as Graham did? <laughs> Right, so I've uh, tried to set up a few examples, and it starts with very easy examples, okay? Perhaps I'd rather sit down for that. So, one can see that, right? Okay, so one important uh, type of examples are solvable permutation groups. And uh, getting some of them is fairly easy. For example, you can start with a large symmetric group, get a pseudo subgroup of that, prime two is always a good candidate for a large size pseudo subgroup. So a pseudo subgroup means it's a P group. So this one here definitely has to be polycyclic. We can get it a little bit bigger or not. Well, let's, let's stick with this P group for the moment. And um, well, so if I look at generators of group of this T, it's just going to be some rather arbitrary set of generators. If I want to have a polycyclic sequence for it, then I have to ask gap for that and it will um, give this to me, relative orders. It's hopefully going to work, yeah. So the relative orders in this case are lots of primes too. Yes, all okay? 
Huh? Maybe you could increase the size of the size. Mm. Another increase? Yeah? yeah? That's good? Right. So if you have a polycyclic generating sequence, then you have a list of elements there. And the relative orders are all the prime two. That's not surprising, because I've started with a group of two power order. So it basically, well, it has to be two power orders at least. All right, perhaps. So you can ask Gap whether or not this is solvable. The whole symmetric group should not be solvable. And this is also true. All right, so this is a basic permutation group example. Perhaps one more thing. You can go over from the permutation group to a um, polycyclic presented group, isomorphism um, PC group of this T. That gives you an isomorphism from your permutation group to a finitely presented group. And look at the image of that. And that, <coughs> well, Gap has a rather generic way of printing these things. It says PC group of a certain size with 15 generators. That's all. You don't see any of these relations. In most cases, you really don't want to see them. You have 15 generators, so you have uh, 15 choose two of these relators. You probably just don't want to see any of that. All right that much for this type of group. In that case, the PCP command would give the same? The PCP? What do you mean? PCP PCP ah, this is a topic that I... PCP group T. Yeah, Graham knows more about all these oh, things. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 Yes, so to confuse all beginners, we have two types of these PC presentations in GAP. One is called PC group, and that works for finite groups only. The other is called PCP group, and that works for all of these, finite or infinite. Perhaps I note this somewhere on the blackboard. So PC group in gap or right in gap this goes for finite solvable groups and the PCP group those are arbitrary polycyclic And they go back to the, well, for these, you need a package, which is called polycyclic package. Polycyclic package. The reason why there are two of these objects is basically historically. The type was implemented first a very long time ago. And when I started to look at, these at the infinite PCP groups in more detail, I did this with my colleague Werner Nickel long, long time ago. And we wanted to implement new algorithms for these infinite groups. And uh, well, we considered it very carefully and then decided that we would set up a completely new package for it. Because expanding the finite group algorithms to the infinite world seemed to be technically rather difficult. That's the basic reason. So there are two types of these. And uh, you will perhaps see them at some stage. OK, some more examples for the end of this first lecture. You can look at abelian polycyclic presented groups. 
there is a command a billion PCP group that needs the number of generators you want to look at and the orders of the cyclic factors that you want to have. 248000 zero, zero, zero again stands for infinite cyclic. What you get is gap tells you PCP group with relative orders 24800. Zero, zero. Fine. Computation with these things allow number of things that you can do. You can look at the torsion subgroup if you want to. You can look at the commutator subgroup. In this case, this should be very easy. It must be trivial. All of these things are fairly easy to deal with. Okay, so that's the abelian groups. Examples for nilpotent groups. What type of nilpotent groups? Well, examples for nilpotent or finitely generated nilpotent groups come from perhaps two sources. One is matrix groups over the integers. The other one is finitely presented groups. I have an example of a finitely presented group here. Perhaps I copy this free group to generators. I have to give the generators names. And now I can take some relations, whatever I wish. It's A squared here. And I take the finitely presented group defined by that. So I have the free group and I've just take one relator telling me that A, the first relator um, to the second power should be trivial. So that gives me a finitely presented group in GAP. <coughs> and now I can ask GAP to compute an important quotient of that and I think I have to load a package for that. They are not going to be the same. So if you look at g.1 ah. equal f.1, no. But they look the same. Their names are the same. Oh. So they look the same, but they're not the same object. Uh, if you test against f1, uh, he doesn't know what to look for. Or what is it? If you want to test whether an element of product is equal to f1, he doesn't know which one to look for. Oh yes, GAP knows. Internally, these things are completely different. They just have the same name that's printed. So, 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 the so they tells, tells it what to Yeah, in GAP these things are objects. So what you see on the surface here is only a little bit. GAP internally knows more about it. It knows very well to which group these two belong. So one belongs to a finitely presented group and the other to a free group. They only have the same name. This is if, if you generate them like this, then this will happen. So one has to get used to that, I'm afraid. <laughs> now, um, I wanted to look at nilpotent quotients. Nilpotent quotient of the finitely presented group, let's say up to class uh, seven. This goes very, very quickly, and it gives me a polycyclic group with lots and lots of relative orders. There is one infinite relative order, the second one, and apart from that, they are all finite. So this is a way of finding interesting nilpotent groups. And also this is a way of investigating finitely presented groups. There are not very many good methods for that. Nilpotent quotients are among the very important approaches. Yes. If you give you different, <coughs> maybe isomorphic groups, if you take them in a different order, maybe I'm not understood precisely what they mean. No, I don't. I mean, could the zero appear elsewhere in the sequence, for instance? <laughs> and would this be a different? Would this be a kind of seriously different group, or, or it's the same? Well, if you take the same group and try to modify it, it gives you the same group. Um, yes, the zero can move around. 
as I told before, I can always arrange it so that the infinite factors move to the bottom. So I could actually modify it. I mean, if you have a polycyclic group, it may have very many polycyclic series. And for each of these, you can take lots of generators. It's by no means unique. Neither the order, nothing. I mean, lots of things are possible. And the choice of generators is sort of uh, given in gap? Like in this case, control. yes. You can also choose yourself if you want ah, okay. to. It's not that going to be very easy, goes. but uh, <laughs> I, mean, I think I make examples of this later. <laughs> In this case, it's given to you. And I mean, if you look at these many generators, you're probably quite happy with having it given instead of having to look for them yourself, right? So yeah. All right. Let's make one more example, and then I make a break. So, Another um, interesting source for infinite PCP groups are space groups. Space groups or crystallographic groups. They are classified in small dimension, as probably many of you know. Famous results, three-dimensional space groups or crystallographic groups have been classified long, long ago, 1930 something. And these catalogs are available in GAP. So you can pick it up. Here I, I say I would like to have uh, the three-dimensional space group with number 101 from the catalog. Now, in what way is this given? It's given to me with rational matrix groups, right? A few rationals in there, mostly it's integers. It's four-dimensional because you, these space groups have an affine representation. Where you have uh, the translations have three-dimensional representation, and then the point group gives you an extra um, generate uh, an, an extra dimension. Now, you can check, but in three dimensions, all of them are solvable, so it's not a big deal, really. Polycyclic group, I guess. Yes. So a space group that's solvable will also be polycyclic. So it's also not a big surprise. And now I can ask for a polycyclic presentation for this object. Again, this works by isomorphism PCP group. And here it goes gives me an isomorphism from my matrix group into a PCP presented group. So I can take the image of this isomorphism and get a PCP group. Now I think I can say something like pin print the presentation for that. So I would not do this for this nilpotent group because that will have a huge presentation. Here we have six generators. Okay, let's see. So the presentation is still um, acceptable. And as you can see, it has exactly the type that I told you before. There are a few powers. The first, the second, and the third generator have a power that um, is then represented by a word in the smaller generators. And then you have lots of conjugate um, relations. Not all of them that I told you are there, because this print presentation only tells you about the important important conjugate um, relations. If there is a conjugate relation that says uh, G2 to conjugate by G1 is equal to G2, then it will not print it. It's considered to be a trivial relation. And also the inverses are left, um, left out if they are not really necessary. This means that you have a nice and compact description for your group, and you just have to know what it means. And here is a PCP presentation for my group. All right, and now it's shortly after three, and I think I'll stop with my first lecture here. All right.